Hallelujah. Come on, put those hands together if you would, wherever you may be. It's time to praise the Lord. It's time to worship and dance before the King. Hallelujah. Do you have a praise in your soul? Do you have a hallelujah in your soul? And the love of God will respond and let it reverberate even now like an echo in your soul. Like an echo in your soul. Come on, children, rejoice. And again, we say rejoice. Come on, come on, come on. Listen, if you can, come on, get up and dance. Get your praise on. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. Faith is lost, my hope exhausted. You will be my strength. And when, when my mind says I'm not, you know how those voices enough, speak to you in your head. You gotta say, I decided I'm not giving up. You won't give up on me. You won't give up on me.
Yeah. 
hallelujah. Come on and just lift up your hands wherever you are. His word promises that he has a plan for us, for us to prosper, never to harm us for a hope and a future. That's the promise that our Father has for us. Come on, if you're excited to see what he has planned for you, come on and just lift up your worship right here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus, for your promise. It's true, it's true. Hallelujah. Oh, Abraham, you're the God of covenant and faithful promises. Mm. Time and time again, you have proven to do just what you said. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to pass great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to me listen from age to age, though the earth may pass away, your word remains the same. History can prove there's nothing you can do, get faithful and true. Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word. People come to pass. Great is your faithful. We want to remind you tonight. True. He's faithful. He's true. Great is your faithfulness. True. From the rising sun. The rising sun. We bless you. We bless you. We bless you. Jesus, 
Sing a song unto the Lord. Come on, don't let your worship die right here. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Come on, just a couple more seconds. We thank you, Jesus. We thank you, Jesus. Father, tonight we give your name honor and glory and wisdom and dominion and power because we know it all belongs to you. So as we turn our attention, our thoughts, our hearts, our minds towards your word, Father, we ask that you would give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart to receive your truth tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Come on, family, put your hands together and give God some praise. We're certainly grateful for the ministry of the worship team, praise and worship team. Uh, there is something about preaching the message before the message that makes the message that I'll preach easier. And so I'm thankful for the worship team tonight for uh, what they shared and how they shared it uh, because it leads us right into where we're going this evening so I'm going to open up in uh, Luke chapter 15, uh, verses 20 through 24. And here's what it says, according to the New Living Translation. 
So he returned home to his father, and while he was still a long way off, his father saw him coming. So filled with love and compassion, his father ran to him, embraced him, and kissed him. His son said to him, Father, I've sinned against both heaven and you, and I am no longer worthy of being called your son. But his father said to the servants, Quick, bring the finest robe in the house and put it on him and get a ring for his fingers and sandals for his feet and kill the calf we have been fattening. We must celebrate with a feast for this son of mine was dead and has now returned to life. He was lost, but now is found. So let the party begin. In the, in the spirit of Mr. W. Pataxlip, for those of you who have been engaged in the Invisible War class, Let me provide a little uh, context and background to our text for this evening. See, much of Jesus' commentary is derived by a conversation amongst religious folks. People who thought they had it all together and they began to grumble, uh, synonymous with complaining or expressing dissatisfaction. They were intolerant and they were grumbling about one thing and they were grumbling about the fact that uh, they complained about the audience that Jesus was entertaining. It wasn't like Jesus had not spent any time with them, but they wanted Jesus exclusively and didn't have room for him to be hanging out with publicans and sinners. So they wanted an exclusive Jesus. They didn't want a Jesus that was shared by other people. They wanted him to himself. See, they were concerned that Jesus was hanging out with people that didn't have the same status they did, didn't share the same uh, digits in their bank accounts that they shared, didn't go to the same country club, didn't hang out at the same malls, didn't wander into the same places. They wanted Jesus all to themselves. And so they were irritated with Jesus. How dare he sit with somebody who wasn't like them? Now, Jesus could have publicly rebuked them. He he could have screamed on them. He could have shouted them out, but that was not the choice that he made. I don't know whether he did it passionately, whether he did it calmly, but Jesus began to share with them a parable. I call this the trilogy of redemption. The trilogy of redemption. Why? Because Luke 15 details three different accounts of the things that Jesus would redeem. He talked about a lost sheep, a lost coin, and a lost son. Now, why would those be the three things that Jesus would highlight in his his commentary or conversation? The sheep would matter to one segment of its population because it was cattle, and cattle and livestock were valuable, and it represented money. A coin, on the other hand, a lost coin, it, for the person who possessed it, it represented power and authority and status. But the last thing that he pursued was is he pursued a son. I think you can tell a lot about a person based on how they pursue what they lost. I'll say that again. You can tell a lot about a person based on how they pursue what they lost. And so in this particular passage and portion of Scripture, Jesus first talks about the lost sheep, and he says, you know what? Who, if he has a a pen 99 sheep, who would not go after the, leave the 99 and go after the one. And then he begins to talk about the coin. He says, if someone dropped a coin that had, or lost a coin that had great value, who wouldn't go pursue that particular coin because it had great value? Both of those things had value to man, but man had value to God. I'll say that again. 
Both of those things, the sheep and the coin, had value to man in their context, but the man is what valued what God valued. It's very interesting that the son that uh, the son was the only part of the trilogy that had the power of choice. God loves God's love is recognized even in the choices that he allows. It's not that his love constrains you from making a decision. His love pursues you regardless of your decision. It waits, it wonders, it seeks, it looks, it finds whatever it is lost. And, and so when you look at the son, the reason the son was important is because Jesus was trying to keep the family together. It was looking at the family, the lost family, the lost sheep, the lost coin. All that he lost, he was trying to emphasize the links that he would go to to get it. Because earlier or later in scripture, Jesus says, Any, there's nothing that you've given me that I've lost. I've kept everything that you've entrusted to me. I've not lost one with the exception of Judas. And so he wants to keep the family together. So the thing that represented the most value, had the most value to him, was the son. The interesting thing was this is not the first time that the love of God pursued anything. It was the love of God from the beginning of time, even before Genesis, the book of Genesis began, began being written, that God determined how he was going to pursue us. Let me help you understand something about the love of God. God, if we talk about God is love. We talk about God has love and God distributes love. Let's change that narrative. Let's correct that perspective and make sure we're thinking out of the right lens. What you need to understand is everything that God does is motivated out of his love because God is not like love. God is not similar to love. God is love. So out of his very nature, out of his very person, the only thing that can come out, no matter how it shows up, is the love of God that we all talk about. And so that love of God begins to pursue a son who had wandered off. And see, he had made a decision in his mind that he wasn't, the son wasn't getting what he thought he deserved. See, he wasn't getting, in his mind, he wasn't getting justice. And, and the Omago day that was stamped on him somewhere, he thought that had escaped him. And so because he didn't feel like he had what he deserved, he left and pursued what he thought he wanted. But how many of you know you can pursue what you want and then not want what you have? Let me say that again. You can have what you want and then not want what you have. And so this young man goes out into the street and the Bible says that he spends his life in riotous living. In other words, he got out there and he found out that life was fun on the front end, but on the back end, he had to pay for the bad decisions that he had made in the front for the money he had spent, for the relationships that he involved himself in, for the conversations he had, and where he spent the night. And Paul, Apostle Paul says this in Corinthians. He says, you know what? You allowed me to go through all of that I went through so that I would come to the end of myself and trust in you. And so this young man, this son, just like the Apostle Paul talks about, he came to the end of himself, and the end of himself was in a pig pen. It was in the middle of the mud. It was in the middle of the dirt. It was in the middle of things that he had never spent any time in. And so exhausted as he was, the Bible says he came to himself. It doesn't say why he came to himself or how he came to himself or what brought him to the end of himself. But at the end of the day, the Bible says he came to himself. Something clicked and it snapped. And all of the things that he had despised, he began to welcome. And all of a sudden, he understands what he's missing is not his money and not his prestige, not his status, and not his community. 
He was missing the love of the Father. It was the love of the Father that he craved. It was the love of the Father that he missed. It was the love of the Father that he lacked. Out of all of the, out of this trilogy, again, out of this trilogy of redemption, when Jesus finds the sheep, he doesn't say anything more about the sheep outside of the fact that he rejoiced. When he found the coin, he had the same reaction. He rejoiced. But when he found the son, he had a totally different response. And his response was more in-depth. It's the first time that you can see, hear, or experience the excitement of the father's love in response to his son's decision-making. His son was the one that got clothed, he got crowned, and he got covered. Let me rehearse those those three C's again, those CCC's of Luke 15. He got clothed, he got crowned, and he got covered. See, what, what begins to happen when we're lost is we begin to lose some of the things that protect us and that cover us. And so when he comes back, Jesus clothes him. And then also when he comes back, he restores his power, his leadership, and his authority by putting a ring on his finger. And then to make sure that he can continue to move about the way the Lord has called him to move, he covers his feet. See, the love of God is inexhaustible and never runs out. See, it increases as it pursues and it never relents. The reason that it never relents is because God is love. There's nothing that can come out of him that is inconsistent with love because love is just who he is, who God is. See, the love of God knows where to find you wherever you've wandered off. The love of God can find you when you're lost in confusion, when you're lost in despair, whether you're lost in brokenness, or whether you've lost your faith. The love of God is a pursuer of the object that it loves, and the object of his love is you. So God guides himself to pursuing this young man. See, God doesn't possess love. He doesn't occupy it. He doesn't distribute it. God is love, and the very nature of God exudes itself in every single circumstance. I don't know where you're lost tonight. I don't know what zip code you're lost in, what thought process you're lost in, what domestic dispute you're lost in, what drug addiction you're lost in, What mental capacity you're lost in. What turmoil you're lost in. What sorrow you're lost in. It doesn't matter where, you lo where you're lost, what zip code you sit in. The love of God will find you wherever you stand. I don't know where you are tonight. I don't know what you're struggling with. I do understand this, that we all come in to this situation tonight lost in something, lost in a place that we can't get out of, seeking for something that we can't find, knocking on a door that won't be opened, but in the midst of your loss. In the midst of your lostness, in the midst of your hurt, in the midst of your pain, even in the midst of your shame, the love of God looks for you and looks to find you. You know, Psalm 23, towards the end, begins this conversation. And he gets to the end, he draws a conclusion. After all the things that he's watched in his life, after 
walking through the valley of the shadow of death, after experiencing the rod and the staff of God, after recognition that the Lord is his shepherd, so he doesn't have to want for anything, he draws one conclusion, one thing that never changes, and he says, surely goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Not every other day, not the fifth day, not monthly. He says, surely his goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. Where does that come from? That comes from the love of God. Like I said in this trilogy, this trilogy of redemption, God wastes nothing. And if he created it, he loves it. And if it's lost, he'll pursue it. He says, if you seek me, you'll find me when you seek me with your whole heart. But he also says, I'm very near you, even in your mouth. I'm near. I'm close to the brokenhearted for those whose hearts are hurting. He's the healer for the woman of the issue, with the issue of blood, for the man who's blind, for the man who couldn't walk, for Lazarus who had actually already died. Jesus was the healer, and it was the love of God. It was his love that even creates the possibility and the potential for his healing. I don't know where you are. I don't know the condition of your relationship to Jesus. I don't know where you find yourself right now. But as sure as I know my name, the love of God is looking for you. The love of God is pursuing you. And the love of God wants to be found by you. The word of God says he came to seek and to save those that are lost. He didn't say I'm waiting for you to come and find me. He said I come to seek and to save those who are lost. Some of you, under the sound of my voice right now, are unsure of what life's next step is for you. You are lost in a sea of confusion. You are lost in a sea of chaos. You are lost in a sea of pain. You've gotten caught in the mire of tragedy and you're not sure what you should do or where you should go or where you should turn and what you should turn to. I promise you this. If you would only turn around, you would find that the love of God is right there behind you. It's been waiting for you. The love of God has been looking for you. You have more value than a lost sheep. You are more valuable than the most beautiful and precious coin. You are the only entity, the only person, the only thing that Jesus says, I will reclothe you, I will crown you, and I will cover you. 
But some of you don't know a love like that. You don't know a love like that because all of the other loves you've experienced have been abusive. All the other types of love you experience have been manipulative. All the other types of love you experienced has been self-seeking. The other loves you experienced are not patient. It's not kind. It's not long-suffering. It actually keeps record of wrongdoing. But the love that you're looking for, the love that is available here for you tonight, is the love of God, the love of the Father, who loves you no matter where you are, who you are, and what condition you find yourself. No matter how far you've walked away, no matter where you've strayed to or strayed from, the love of God is here and available for you tonight. I've said it in so many different ways. But if you don't know Jesus tonight, then you don't know the love of God yet. And Jesus has been pursuing you. So let him find you tonight. Stop running. Stop hiding. And allow the love of God to embrace you in a different way. So if under the sound of my voice, this would be the first time you're making a public commitment or profession of your faith. I'm going to ask you to say this prayer with me. Father, I thank you that in the midst of my sin and my shame, that you found me. Father, forgive me for avoiding and run, running away from your love. Father, please reclothe me. Please crown me and please cover me. I've lived life my own way. And I've gone astray, but I surrender my heart and my life to you tonight. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. If you said that prayer with me tonight, if your heart is in alignment with Jesus' call to you, I want to say welcome to the kingdom and the family of God. So thank you for being with us tonight. We're so glad that you were here and that you spent time with us virtually. So if you gave your heart to the Lord, please text SAVED to 631-250-2688 or call 718-306-1061. I want to say welcome to the family and the kingdom of God. So, Father, we thank you for tonight. We thank you for this opportunity. We thank you for your word. More than anything else, we thank you for your love that envelops us. We thank you that you pursue us even when we go another way and are unwilling to be found. But we thank you for your unconditional pursuit of us. And so we thank you that you are love and we recognize that you are love tonight. We thank you for this time in your presence. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's say something good as we leave this place but never God's presence. Jesus is Lord. Period. We believe it. We proclaim it. And we're seeing it come to pass. God bless you and have a great evening.